So I, I learned a lot in this meeting. Basically, my, my work focuses more on the genomic side, the epigenomic side, the comparative genomic side, basically on the aspect of interpreting genomes uh, and understanding genomes. The disease aspect is something that my group has been getting more and more into, and sort of seeing this wide diversity of techniques and backgrounds, I think has helped me a lot in basically understanding a little bit of where the field uh, is positioned, and also uh, not necessarily uh, new people that I met uh, in this symposium, but people that I know already with whom I have had a chance to, to interact, to exchange ideas, and I think we're going to be starting some new collaborations, yes. On one hand, it's a technological uh, shift, namely from the ability to only survey specific regions in a small number of individuals, we are now seeing the ability to sequence uh, large, large cohorts of people. So basically the first thing that is dramatically changing is the ability to actually detect rare variants. The second technological shift is actually the ability to, to do phenotypic assays for, again, large cohorts of people and specific cell types for all of these people. So what we're going to see is, number one, on the genotypic end, on the genotyping end, what we're going to see is a shift from a small number of SNPs and sort of a large uh, general understanding of haplotypes to really a completion of the haplotype map of uh, human populations and uh, a much further deepening of that variation on one hand, providing the genotypic infrastructure. On the other hand, there's going to be the, the phenotypic um, expansion on both the axis of cell types and conditions as well as individuals. And I think the two, the two aspects together are really uh, going to be able to not only give us the association with disease, which is a very complex phenotype and sort of much longer term, but also give us all the intermediate phenotypes that uh, you can think of as expression, chromatin, um, epigenetics, uh, transcription, replication. So indeed, I think that uh, it's, it's number one, uh, an area which, is, which has the potential to, to transform the way that medicine has been done in <laughs> all of history, the entire history of medicine, I think, is about to be transformed with many of the insights that can be gained from the kinds of data that's presented here, as well as the personalized diagnosis that will then rely on the kinds of approaches that, that are shown here. Uh, well, no, not so many people were asking. They thought that it was a really medical, perhaps too medical, because uh, a lot of basic science is being presented here. But, but I think that people are looking forward to knowing more about that because we are trying to implement all these technologies but more in the clinical part. So according to the results we get, we try to um, uh, select patients to give them a, a specific treatment. So it's a personalized medicine, something that is being talked about. Yeah, the patients come to our hospital. I mean, it's a, a big hospital with a, not only breast cancer, that we have a big unit, but also colorectal and, and lung cancer. And what the clinicians want is to select some patients for a specific treatment, specific uh, clinical trials. So we get those data, not only uh, clinical data, but also uh, when we get all the paraffin embedded tissue, we send it to the lab. And then in the lab, they perform some genetic tests such as uh, Sanger sequencing or also sequenome, and then we get back those results to the physicians, and then they select for the clinical trials according to the results. But the thing is, it's quite expensive. Actually, the prices have been getting down and down, but the, the biggest problem is the funding, because only one sequence, only one patient, it can cost about 150 euros and it's something that it has to be funded by someone and it's something that we are looking forward to implement but it's sometimes it's quite expensive if there's no uh, companies behind us or uh, well, pharmaceutical companies sometimes it can be hard to sequence at least use the sucronome that it's kind of the cheapest thing now that we have and for our field that it's oncology 
I think the, the fact that we have a symposium every year uh, or, or more frequently uh, of this, this type is, is really valuable for many people who work in the building. I personally work in comparative genomics, so uh, many of the talks, particularly this time, have been uh, very interesting for me, uh, talking about uh, model species and that's stuff that I can relate to the work that I'm, I'm doing day to day. Last year was a bit more on uh, purely on medical and human genomics, which is also very interesting, but slightly different from what I do. Well, that's the thing. I actually work in bioinformatics myself, so I don't, I'm not going to be directly involved in using any of the new technologies, but obviously it's very important for a bioinformatician to know, the, particularly to know the limitations of the new technologies, to know where there might be problems in the sequence and, and how to account for those. Some of the talks yesterday were talking about applying statistical processes to, in order to correct for uh, problems that we may observe in, in the, the large data sets that we get from these sequencing technologies. Well, in, in general, for, for me, uh, uh, as a doctoral student, the, the positive thing is that I get to meet a lot of people and, and talk to a lot of people and have some ideas whether they will actually want to establish collaborations with us, uh, we'll have to see. But uh, certainly the, the sharing of ideas that you get the opportunity over the couple of days during lunch and coffee and things like that, and, and hearing of the new ideas and what has been done in the world is very, uh, gives you a lot of uh, Possibilities to explore more avenues yourself in your own research. Well, I kind of like to see what uh, can be done in really big uh, um, sequencing centers, such as BGI, uh, yeah. and uh, what can be done as well in like smaller places in hospitals. Yeah, and I think uh, here we have been able to see. How, how these two, you know, um, ways of, of doing science exist. I think you learn much more if you actually uh, hear them explaining their work, because it's much more, uh, you know, you can really notice what they want to emphasize or not. It's much easier in this way, rather than to uh, read what they have published. I mean, uh, I think I feel it's a personal opinion, but uh, it's much easier to me. The summary of what we see basically is that there are variants that are only relevant in females where there are other variants that are only relevant in males and there are also in cases that are relevant in both genders there could be differences in how relevant they are in the magnitude of the effect that they have in the biology. Again that's not unexpected, uh, there are a lot of diseases that have differential risk and in fact um, uh, some initial analysis that people are doing right now indicates that even disease risk um, is estimated more uh, in, in a more accurate way if the genders are actually taken into account as opposed to doing a sort of a, a complete uh, set of individuals without taking into account the gender. I'm not so sure that prognosis necessarily is going to be sort of the major thing um, except of course for monogenic disorders of very large, uh, very high penetrance. I think that when it comes to complex disorders which is primarily what is driving the technology and where most of the funding is, I think it's going to be mainly the ability to understand the biology. I mean, always, when the, if you increase the resolution of the experiment, you understand more about the granularity of the phenotype and the individual uh, biological effects. And sometimes, as I say, the devil is in the detail. Uh, the more detail we get, the more we can understand uh, how this, uh, these variants are contributing to the manifestation of the disease. Essentially, approach is sort of this asymptotic goal that at least I have and a lot of other people have, which is if two people have a different genotype in a specific position, what is the first thing that is different between them because of that genotype? What is the first biochemical event in the cell that is different because of that, uh, that genotype? And the more we're able to sequence uh, both the genome as well as um, the transcriptome or to use sequencing to identify transcription factor binding sites and so on, the more we can get closer to that kind of question. Now that, as a result, means that by understanding the biology, we understand more of the causality, and therefore we're able to treat those diseases much more efficiently. Um, so that's what I think we're going. I think we're going to a better treatment rather than better prognosis, but I'm not excluding the fact that there will be some impact on prognosis as well. <laughs> Planète, j'attends combien ne me réveiller.
Uh, it's a great symposium, I think, uh, mostly because it combines uh, several different disciplines. I think this may be the first uh, symposium at the CRG where two different programs are actually creating the same symposium together at a joint interest uh, between the two programs on the medical side from the genes and diseases and more on the genomic side from our program. So I think it's going quite well. Yes, yeah, so uh, I think the CRG has the first uh, um, high-seq machine in Spain, uh, which is already up and operational, people are already sequencing this. I cannot wait to get the Pacific Biosciences machine in our institute, of course. Uh, and it's not just, I think, the price that's going to come down, I think the quality of the data uh, that these machines provide will also increase quite a bit. Uh, at not just the quality in terms of decreasing the error rate, this is what we heard a lot about uh, at this conference, but it's also the completeness of the genomes that we get with these kinds of uh, technologies will become better and better, allowing us to perhaps ask more delicate questions about the evolution of these genomes, as well as the interaction of particular tricky parts of the genome uh, to some medical questions as well as functional questions. <laughs> Uh, a namesake of mine uh, in uh, 1970s in an essay said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Uh, and therefore, medicine being really a part of biology, in medicine actually, more and more doctors are realizing that uh, evolutionary theory as well as evolutionary approaches have real basis to what they're doing. Uh, this applies, of course, to genetic uh, diseases just because uh, by understanding what is different between humans and some other species, we can really try to understand what is the functional meaning behind these particular changes. Uh, but also, of course, the kind of the showcase uh, argument for this is evolution of uh, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, because us understanding what kind of selective forces are uh, acting on the, uh, the evolution of this antibiotic resistance, we can begin to understand how to battle them.